It's been a few months now since the 18 August mutiny that ousted President uh, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita in Mali. Our transitional government is now in place for an 18-month period, leading to presidential and legislative elections. The government, which is currently led by Ba Ndor, who's a retired colonel major, has many issues on hand, including dealing with regional insecurity and hundreds of thousands of displaced citizens displaced by militant attacks and a combination of drought and floods. Well, to tell us a little bit more about his, how his country is meeting these and other challenges, I spoke to Mali's ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency Mahaman Audu Sise. Uh, your Excellency, perhaps we can begin with uh, how things have settled in your country. Uh, there was a coup, but there now is an interim government uh, with a civilian leading it. How are things going at this time? Okay, at uh, this point in time, uh, what I would say is that uh, since the change of regime in August, last August, several developments took place towards the return to constitutional order, as wished by the Malian people and as supported and encouraged by ECOWAS, an international community at large. These developments include, first, the adoption of the Charter and the roadmap for the transition, followed by the appointment of a civilian president and a vice president of the transition. The president himself, in turn, appointed the civilian prime minister and a transition government who was put in place soon after. Finally, a national council of transition composed of representatives of various segments of the country, including the armed forces, civil society organizations, political parties, faith-based community, etc., and acting as the legislative body of the transition was set up to complete the transitional institutions provided for by the Charter. Therefore, we can say that everything is now in place for the implementation of the economic and social political developments or social uh, political programs, sorry, designed for the return to normalcy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about government because for a long time they weren't able to do much. There wasn't even a cabinet at one stage, if I remember. Um, are, is government now able to deliver services and do the work of government for the citizens? Of course, attending to normal issues of providing services to citizens is a standing task uh, for all governments. With the setting up of all transition institutions, as I just said, the government is now fully dedicated to its main duty of providing required services to its people. Of course, the task is huge and complicated by major challenges posed by the COVID pandemic with the resulting economic hardships, to also by a persistent security issues and all sorts of social pressures for better living conditions. Notwithstanding all these challenges, the government is striving to maintain a strong focus on delivery. Okay, so is the, um, it, the I mean, one of the things that the interim government was meant to work on was uh, reforms of the constitution and decentralizing power. Is that something that has started already? It has started. Uh, actually, the, the action plan of the transition government has just been presented to the National Transition Council, you know, which acts as the legislative, as I said, uh, body. It was presented to the National Transition Council by the Prime Minister, Mr. Mokhtar Wan. Uh, we, and then uh, uh, the plan provides for implementation of several constitutional, political, and institutional reforms, some of which started as far back as 2012. Envisaged course of action aims, among other things, at finalizing a territorial reform, revamping the electoral system, 
continuing, continuing the process of regionalization, enhancing security all over the national territory through revision, appropriation, and implementation of the peace and reconciliation agreement, which resulted from the Algeria process. And also speeding up the process of disarmament, demobilization, and the reintegration of former combatants in the, in the north and center of the country. It includes also the dismantling of all self-defense militias and also the redeployment of national defense and security forces all over the territory. Is everybody in support of this interim government? Um, I suppose citizens are not demonstrating anymore. Perhaps that is approval. But what about the opposition parties that had led this citizen movement? Okay, at this point in time, one can say that uh, almost all national stakeholders in the beginning pledged their full, their full commitments towards a successful transition for the benefit of the people. However, differences may exist from one party to another on how to achieve this and uh, also on who are the best players you know, to, assume, to assume the leading roles in various situations. You know, democracy allows both differences, and this is a sign of maturity, as long as it doesn't lead to uncontrolled social and political unrest. What do you think is different this time around? Because Niger has had its challenges for many years, but there seems to be some kind of um, structure in terms of moving forwards. Are you hopeful that Two years from now, we're not going to see another coup d'etat, another military uh, uh, intervention, and that from now on, there will be civilians running the country and uh, the pu public able to vote who they want uh, to lead them. This is what we are striving for. Of course, that's uh, the main objective, you know, of uh, the process of uh, uh, revamping the, the whole system so that uh, there, is, there will be no place, you know, no room for any such uh, unconstitutional, I would I say, uh, uh, coups. Yeah, so this is the objective. And I hope, I hope that uh, by the end of the transition, you know, everything will have uh, like been solved, yeah. All right, I'm sure that uh, everybody hopes that as well. The other yes. big problem, which uh, mm -hmm. persists, and it's not just a market <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also the region, and uh, that, of course, is the ongoing uh, militant attacks that have been taking place. What is the situation on the ground at this time? Okay, the so-called asymmetrical war is continued sporadically, you know, in several parts of the Sahel region, resulting in, uh, in massive deaths, not only among national and partner defense forces or defense uh, uh, partners uh, forces, but also among civilians. Uh, but the recent coordinated and joint military operations by Mali National Army, uh, the so-called farmers, and also Balkan and the Sahel the joint force were successful in striking, you know, decisive blows against terrorist groups in the region, and particularly in the north and the center of Mali. However, so the security situation still remains uncertain in certain areas, yes. Do you know who these militants are and what they're fighting for in the region? Okay, the most known and most active Malian radical groups operating in the region are the interconnected Ansar Islam and Katiba Mas Masina headed respectively by Yaga Agali and Amadou Kufa. While in favor of a unified and integral Malian territory, these two groups made it clear that they are fighting for the application of the Sharia in an Islamic state. In addition to these uh, groups, you also have uh, some connections, you know, with international terrorists and jihadist groups such as uh, Daesh and uh, ECMI. Uh, finally, there are also groups that have no political goals, 
but you know, take advantage of the confused situation to perpetuate sordid hijacking or strengthen to strengthen their national, uh, their transnational criminal activities, such as uh, smuggling, drug, and human trafficking. I believe that uh, one of the interventions that your government wants to pursue is dialogue with some of these militant groups, uh, some of these jihadists, and then pave the way for elections. Is that something that you're hopeful will bear fruit? Because, you know, it's probably something that other countries won't even consider doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there is a, a lot is being said about the government's intention to pursue or initiate dialogue with uh, the jihadists. This, however, calls for some clarification. The need to undertake a dialogue with the radical groups is not a decision being imposed by the government. It is the result of multiple and consistent requests articulated during the nationwide consultations, namely the Conference for National Understanding in 2017, the National Inclusive Dialogue in 2019, and the sessions of uh, national consultation in 2020. All these consultations resulted in a consensus on the need to initiate a dialogue with radical groups with a view not necessarily to reach you know, unbalanced uh, agreements with these groups, but at least you know, to demobilize from them those, those Malians who joined, not by fanaticism, but probably by opportunism, yeah? and then uh, you know, be able to bring them back to the nation family. So that's the main objective of this. All right, so those are the national efforts, but at the same time, the leaders of the group of five uh, Sahel countries, uh, the G5 Sahel met on the 15th and the 16th of this month in Jamena in Chad. And um, I wonder what came out of uh, this meeting? What kind of cooperation is taking place uh, with this G5 to find a regional solution for this militancy? Yeah. The G5 style summit in, in, uh, in Jamena, in Chad, uh, which, uh, as you said, uh, was held uh, very recently, uh, was a, a renewed opportunity for the head of state of Sahel countries and the international partners, uh, in particular France, to reaffirm their strong determination in the fight against terrorism. Among the main outcomes, I can define, uh, one can define, identify, sorry, the maintaining in the region of the 5,100 French troops comprising the Balkan force, the decision to enhance the operationality of the joint Sahel force, which the Sahel uh, heads requested the UN, United Nations you know, to place under Chapter 7 uh, of the United Nations Charter with a view to uh, security uh, is continued funding. There was also uh, the approval by the African Union of a 20 million funding, 20 million dollars funding for the Joint Sahel Force through the African Peace Facility financed by the uh, European Union. There was also the decision to deploy uh, by Chad 1,200 troops in the so called free border. Uh, zone of Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. And uh, there was also a commitment to increase coordination between the Sahel National Defense and Security, the Joint Force, and the international partners, and to enhance cooperation among the G5 countries through sharing of intelligent information. The French have a, a large contingency uh, in the region, and yeah. Uh, back home, uh, President Macron is uh, under enormous pressure to withdraw his troops from the region. He seems committed to the cause, but he's not going to be president forever. And it may be the next president may struggle to convince his country that it's still something important to do. They are trying, you know, to uh, enhance 
the operation, the operationality of uh, the the joint force, for instance, uh, the Sahel joint force. That's the the joint forces of uh, the five uh, Sahel countries. So with uh, the help also with uh, the help of uh, partners uh, within uh, ECOWAS and uh, other countries, uh, I think. Uh, uh, in the meantime, you know, uh, there will be a force uh, capable of uh, uh, taking in charge you know, all those issues. Uh, that's what I personally hope. Okay. Whilst all of this is playing out, uh, the UNHCR talks about the country facing a humanitarian crisis. 300,000 people, I believe, are displaced uh, by insecurity and more recently, uh, climate change causing drought and flooding. How's your government um, trying to help these displaced persons? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Mali has been experiencing a very difficult political and uh, socio-economic situation since 2012, you know, political and uh, crisis and uh, security crisis you know, that happened in, in 2012. This situation has now been exacerbated by a uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as uh, drought and uh, floods that recently uh, hit the country. These combined factors resulted in huge numbers of refugees and internal displacement is true. On how the government intends to attend to a situation, uh, let me just recall a few facts. In 2018, Tripartite agreements were signed between Mali, UN uh, Commission for Refugees, and host countries to repatriate Malian refugees in Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mauritania. That happened in 2018. Uh, yet, uh, in 2018, again, the government of Mali, with the support of the United Nations, devised and implemented the humanitarian response plan in the north and center of Mali to provide emergency assistance to 1.5 million vulnerable persons through the distribution of food, portable water, and education services. This plan has now been renewed you know, for 2021. In 2020, the government provided vital assistance to nearly 40,000 40, internal displaced persons and repatriates a little more than 200 refugees. This serious issues is one of the main priorities outlined in the Transition Government Plan Act of, of Action that was presented to the National Transition Council, as I just said. Uh, the measures that are sought in this context in order to facilitate the return of refugees and displaced persons to their original habitats include training and job creation, in the sphere of arts and crafts, notably through the establishment of vocational training centers in seven pilot cities. All right, so one of the challenges that we've seen in other countries in the region is that once you have these militants and these insurgencies, access to people in need becomes quite difficult. I wonder if uh, your country, Mali, is going through the same thing that uh, You've got these people that are displaced, uh, but you're not able to reach them, partly because of militant actions, but also maybe even infrastructure destroyed by flooding and things like that. Yeah, that's the main challenge. That's the main challenge, I must say. Uh, and that's why uh, the government is trying you know, to do all, all that is possible you know, to uh, uh, reach out you know, to those uh, populations. It's not easy, it's not an easy task because of all these uh, challenges. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we have to, and uh, the government is trying you know, to do uh, uh, its best. Um, Your Excellency, let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 and some of the interventions that uh, you've been able to put into place to protect people and uh, maybe slow down the fatality rate. Yeah, indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the worst sanitary crises confronting all countries in the recent years. And Mali is no exception. The first public case was recorded on the 25th 
of March 2020, in a context of increased insecurity in the north, in the northern and central parts of the country. As on the 23rd of February 2021, so that's a few days ago, the official figures stand at 186,635 persons tested, 8,306 positive cases, 348 deaths, unfortunately, 6,305 recoveries. As early as February 2020, the government put in place two organs to deal with the pandemic. One is the Defense High Council presided by the head of state. And the second is the National Coordinating Committee lodged within this Ministry of Health and Social Development. These two organs launched a very early, at a very early stage, programs of awareness and prevention along the lines prescribed by uh, WHO and national health institutions to mitigate the social economic impacts of the lockdown and restrictive measures on the most vulnerable citizens and social professional categories, the government took a series of relief measures, including, for instance, the distribution of food stock, payment of water and electricity bills, reduction on taxes on milk, rice, and food. All right. So is there a vaccine program that's ready to roll out? Where, where are you in terms of uh, this next phase of fighting the pandemic, i.e. vaccinations? OK. In the meantime, the, uh, the, the curve is coming down because from a peak of 100, 150 uh, a day, that was in January and December and January, now we are looking at about uh, 15, 15 cases a day. So the curve, the curve has, uh, has come down. Uh, like many countries on the African continent, Mali has defined a national vaccination strategy to enhance the fight against the COVID pandemic. The vaccination campaign is uh, scheduled to, uh, to start in April 2021, or next month. And we'll begin with uh, frontline medical workers and people of uh, 60 years plus and persons with uh, comorbidities. The government has launched a first order of uh, over 8 million doses of uh, Indian origin in the framework of COVAX. The doses are due to arrive in, uh, in March this month. And uh, at this juncture, I would like to pay a huge tribute to His Excellency the President, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, for the tremendous role he played as the President of the AU in ensuring that no country, no African country, is left aside as far as access to vaccines in the framework of international programs is concerned. All right, so and that uh, was uh, Mali's ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency Mahaman Sise. Uh,